Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Paul Ogando. Let's do something. Would you stand for me if you're able to? You'll be sitting for a while, so just stand and we'll go together before God. Father God, I ask tonight that you would absolutely lead us just as you have. That you continue to speak to us tonight. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. Come and teach us the things that we have to hear from you, Father. Use me to communicate whatever principles you have for us, whatever truth you have for us. You can use anybody, Father, but you are using me tonight, and I'm grateful for that. So I pray that your word be communicated in that same way into people's heart, Father. We prepare our own heart, our ground, Father, so that the seed might be ready to give plenty of fruit in our life, Father. Now, just as you bless us here at the Rock, this amazing church, I play a blessing over all the other churches who are in the Inland Empire and around the world. Father, we don't take this lightly. We have prayed this way for years because we believe that, Lord. There is one kingdom, and that is yours. So advance your kingdom. We're in no competition with churches, Lord. We're advancing your truth in this area. So advance it all over the world today. We need many reaching, as many as we can, before your return, Father. Thank you for allowing us to do that. So bless them today. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to be focusing mainly on two books of the Bible. So um, if you want to, if you have one of those Bible that has a marker, or if you have your iPhone or iPad, that's okay too. Um, if you go to John, Book of John, chapter 21, and mark it, and then go to the Book of Luke, and we're going to start in chapter five. We're going to start in chapter five. So, John 21. You mark it there. If you have one of these little ribbons thing, and then you book, you go to Luke chapter 5. And so this is so, um, what we're going to look at today, we're going to navigate through a very interesting subject. As a matter of fact, um, part of this message came to me when Pastor Luke was teaching on, on Peter. And I had read in my own personal time, in my own devotional time, John chapter 21. And then he covered, talking about Peter, Luke chapter 5. And so they collide in such a beautiful way. And I want to communicate that today because I believe God spoke to my heart personally about this and I want to bring it out to you. Jesus uh, uses such an interesting phrase and I, and I don't want you to dismiss what we're going to talk about today just by the simplicity of the phrase. The phrase might sound simple um, and almost very common but that doesn't diminish the value that it has. For tonight I want to call this message following Jesus. Wow that sounds like a no-brainer. Sounds like a very Christianese kind of term and, um, and understanding if you're ever in the gospel. If you've ever been in a church, you understand it's following Jesus. A lot of people talk about it and say it. But as I study the life of the disciples and people, I'm, I'm starting to understand that following Jesus is a little more complex and a little more profound and a little more amazing uh, and important for every Christian to understand. In the book of John, you don't have to go there. I'll read it for you. I believe chapter 10. He says the following. He says in John 10, 27, very, very famous. says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus makes this amazing statement that sounds so simple but so profound. He says, my sheep hear my voice. You know what Jesus says? There's an implication that you and I have the capacity to hear what God may say to us. You have the capacity in you to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Therefore, he's saying, my sheep hear my voice. If you're part of this, you can hear what I have to say. And then, and then he goes, and, and, and I know them. Oh, wow. How amazing that the God of the universe knows you and knows me. You're not alone. We sang it today. You're not in your own little world, in your own little problem. There's something greater at work. He says, I know them. If you're part of my flock, if you're part of the process, if you're giving your heart to me, if we're walking together, I know you. And then, and then, he says something maybe more profound. He just doesn't say, you can hear my voice and, and I know you. He says, you know what, if you can hear my voice and I know who you are, then you follow me. And that really is what this whole thing is all about. Is the ability to follow Jesus. Is the ability to make an investment in following Jesus in every aspect of our life. Following Jesus is profound. Following Jesus is, is like the staple of what we're trying to do as Christians. And so when we look at a phrase, following Jesus, it sounds cliche. It sounds, oh yeah, we got, I'm following Jesus, brother. But we're going to look at today how many times Jesus says the same thing, follow me, follow me, follow He's trying to communicate something. Let me tell you a story. If you've heard this story, 
bear with me. If you haven't, then it'll be new information for you. But many years ago, I, probably 1999, maybe year 2000, I was in South America and Peru. And so my wife's family and a couple of friends and us, we were going into a small town in the jungles of Peru. This small town is so tiny, there's only two ways, either many, many hours through the jungle by bus and terrible terrain, or, or you can take a plane. But because it was such a small town, the plane only went to town twice a week, on Mondays and on Thursdays. So we planned our trip around that. Okay, we're going to fly in on Monday, minister throughout the week, fly out on Thursday, and then do some more ministry in Lima, in the capital of the country. And so, you know, we embarked on this trip. We bought our plane tickets. Um, and so we landed in this small town in the jungle, and everything was great. The ministry time was absolutely fantastic. I mean, amazing deliverances, healings. It was unbelievable. We happened to be there, we didn't know, on the week of the anniversary of the town. So, you know, the mayor of the town finds out, man, there's some Americans here and, and tourists and ministers because we're doing an event in the park. Uh, I want to have them over in my office. My wife's uncle, who is very prophetic, says, I want to have, have a word for you. I want to pray for you. The mayor was absolutely open. Sure, we go in there. He prays for a beautiful time together. In our team, there was two local guys uh, from Peru, but one of them that afternoon when the mayor invited us to go to his office, he was tired. He said, you know, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in my hotel room, and then you guys go. So we went and took pictures with him, prayed with him, and he was so excited. He's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you guys our honored guest tomorrow in our parade. I want you to be there next to me, and I will type up a letter recognizing you guys as honored guests in my town. Wow, you know, it's a big deal. It's a small town. Anybody would know, you know what? Ah, it's a small town, whatever. But the Bible says that anybody in authority has the backing of God. And so we believe that, and so we pray for him. He gives us this letter. My wife's uncle has the letter in his back. Thursday arrives, time to go. We get to the, to the airport. And so we get to the airport. We're ready, put our bags down. No plane. All right, well, let's start. Hey, where's the plane? We're supposed to part. Well, there's no plane. And so we're waiting. Is the plane late? Well, they're calling Lima. Where's the plane? Where's the plane? I mean, we're stuck deep in the jungle. Where's the plane? Finally, we get word from the airline saying, hey, there was no passengers flying out of Lima to the town. So we were going to fly an empty plane and pick you guys up. So forget it. So there goes our money. They just left us there. So I was like, awesome, you know. Um, so, so in the airport, here we are, you know, we get together. And so we start praying, Lord, you know, help us. And so one guy hears us kind of praying the commotion. What's going on? I mean, there's hardly anybody flying. And he says, you know what? I know that there's an Air Force Base, and from the Air Force Base here in town, there's a plane that goes to Lima every day to bring supplies and people that need help. So the guys on our behalf, he goes, gets on his motorcycle, bing, going through town with one of our friends, and he gets there, talks to the guy at the Air Force Base, hey, you know, and then what turns out is he says, hey, come over, let's all go there. So we all go to the Air Force Base, we're outside at the gate, right, there's a military there, and one of the guys in charge of the Air Force says, well, you know what, there's a problem with this. He said, this airplane is designed for supplies and for low-income people, which obviously we're not. We can afford an airplane ticket. But we just didn't have an airplane to pay for. <laughs> so we're just kind of there, you know. And so we're like, man. And, and out of the blue, I mean, we know it's the spirit. <laughs> My wife's uncle says, but you know what? We're friends with the mayor. I mean, now what a way to you know, kind of slide it in there. Hey, <laughs> hey we're friends with the mayor of Saposoa as a town. We're friends with the mayor of Saposoa. He's like, really? You're friends with the mayor? Well, if you can prove that, maybe we can let you on the plane. <laughs> Out comes the letter. You know? <laughs> hey, so, hey, right here. It says right here. And, and the guy says something so amazing. He grabs the letter, reads it, you know, honor guests in Spanish. And he says the following thing. He says, if your name is on this letter, then follow me. Those were probably the most important words to us at that moment. If your name is on this letter, then follow me. And he walked us straight into a plane, and we landed in Lima at the time we needed to be there by the grace of God. Now, give a hand to the Lord. It was a fun testimony. What's amazing is not that that happened to us, but this. Our relationship with that mayor allows us to get a benefit that we otherwise wouldn't be able to have. Yet our relationship with Jesus has endless possibilities. But in order for us, for Jesus to lead us, we must follow him. And that's the important part of this. See, we knew the mayor gave us access to things we didn't have access to. You know Jesus and gives you access to things you normally don't have access to, but you must follow him to get there. 
And, and this is what we want to talk about tonight. How do, how do I get there? How do I follow Jesus? Following Jesus, following Jesus. I want to answer that statement. Following Jesus, following Jesus is rewarded by faith. Following Jesus is rewarded by faith. Go to Luke chapter 5. And we'll start tonight there. In Luke chapter 5, it's a fascinating um, episode. Pastor Luke alluded to this and, um, in his teachings. And, and when I was reading, I just, it was so interesting. So here's Jesus, right? Jesus yet is not very famous. He's just a teacher among many, to be honest, because there was many rabbis at the time. And Jesus, as you, as you read the word of God, he's called rabbi or master or teacher. So there was many that could teach the law of the time. Jesus was not famous yet. As a matter of fact, he had no disciples in this portion of the word of God. So Jesus is teaching the people. He's teaching the crowd, and everybody's kind of listening. And, and, you know, obviously he's one of the best, or if not the best, obviously in this process, in teaching the truth of the word of God. So he's there. And it says that the disciples, there weren't disciples yet. It says that Peter, um, sons of seventy. And another guy there, and they were there cleaning their nets. They were fishermen. That was their job. They were cleaning their nets. And it makes it very clear the word of God says that they caught nothing. They went out to fish, and they got nothing. And if you know, I don't know a lot about fishing, but I know in, in the sea, in the ocean, the best way to fish is at night. And when I lived in Peru, there was um, two coastal towns that you can even smell the fish when you're driving to town. There's so much fish going on. And so everybody goes out early, early, midnight, you know, early and lay out the net. And they go back in the morning and get it. Why? Because when the sun hits the surface of the ocean, fish go down to the colder waters. So the disciples know their job. They've been working all night. They're stringing their nets. They're bringing it out absolutely empty. They're cleaning it, getting all the junk, all the seaweed, everything, while Jesus is teaching. So, see, I just want you to know that multitasking was not invented today. So they're working and listening. So if your husband says he's working and watching TV, he is. Leave him alone. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so the disciples are cleaning their nets and they're going at it, right? And so, but they're listening to Jesus. Like, man, this guy's an interesting teacher. You know, he's teaching and, and I'll keep cleaning and doing my job. And so it says that so many people came that Jesus started backing because they were, you know, getting closer. And he's almost in the water. So he says, he jumps in one of the boats, Peter's boat, says, hey, would you push it off the shore a little bit. So he is. So Jesus is standing on the boat teaching the people. And we pick it up right there. If you go with chapter 5, verse 5. says, Simon, Simon, Jesus tells him, hey, listen, let's go in. Turns around and says, let's go in uh, so we can do this. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. I'm reading the international version because I like how it tells it. International version says, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I would let down the net. This is such a profound teaching. And believe me, uh, as a teacher of the word of God, I taught this verse so many times on the, on the basis of faith. But here's what's amazing that I didn't realize till now is that Peter was not yet a follower of Christ. It's not like Peter saying, man, I know that's my Jesus. I'm going to do what he says. No, no, no. Peter did it. Out of respect, Peter's like, well, this guy's a rabbi, you know, I'm on a, I, kind of awkward, people are looking at me, hey, an important person is telling you to do something, so you better, out of respect, out of, respect, out of your word, I, I will go ahead and do this. You know what God is testing? Jesus wanted to know, would you follow? Would you follow? Because later on, he's about to ask me a very profound question. So Peter says, listen, I've done my job, but at your word, I will do that job. And for us, for us who follow Christ, this is so important. If you're a car salesman, if you're a person in an office, you've done your job so many times and come up empty, ask God. Ask Jesus. Say, Jesus, how do I do this? And follow him. Because faith is rewarded. Faith is rewarded when we follow him. We're talking about faith all this. I don't know how many months we'll be covering faith in chapter 11. But it's really important that you know that faith is rewarded. Peter said, I'm going to go ahead and do it at your word. Continue saying, look what it says. Verse 6, when they had done so, that's another message right there by itself. When they had what? I mean, you can have the greatest idea in the world. If you didn't do anything about it, it was just a phenomenal idea, period. And it's so, I mean, this is so profound. He said, listen, I'm giving you something. And when they have done so, when they did it, it said they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signal their partners in the other boat, come and help them, to help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Are you kidding me? 
I mean, these guys have worked so hard on their own. I mean, Peter, Peter wasn't just any fisherman. Peter had done this all his life. His daddy was a fisherman. He was a fisherman. This is not new to them. This is their job. This is their deal. This is their business. But they've never done that much work ever in their life until Jesus told them to do it. I'm going to tell you something tonight. If you've ever done your job your way, follow him starting tonight. Follow him starting tonight. Set your mind and say, I'm going to do it in faith. I'm going to do it in faith that I will follow what Jesus is saying because you're going to find yourself absolutely not being able to sustain what he's asking you to sustain what he's giving you. If you start saying, God, I'm going to do it your way, not my way. And it's so important for us to do that because faith is rewarded when we follow Jesus. For he said, then he says to them when they saw so much, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his at Jesus' knees and said, look what he says, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. You know what Jesus just did? I mean, Peter just had a conversion. Peter said, man, right here, I knew you were a teacher. Now I know you're Lord. Now I know you're Christ. Now I know you're something beyond amazing. And I, I cannot be in your presence. That is so awesome for us to see that when we have faith, God is going to surprise us in a way that we'll say, God, I, I'm too small. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. I mean, woe is me. I mean, he just realized this is what you are is unbelievable. But it only happens when we decide to follow Jesus. Verse 10 Sorry, verse 9 says, For he and all his companions were astonished at the cache of fish they had taken. It's an understatement. Verse 10 says, And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and when we read about them a lot, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, listen to this, don't be afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid? It would be kind of like, wow, how did, how did that just happen? From now, from now, from now on, you will fish for people. And that is so important because when Jesus is asking us to follow him, listen to this, he's going to give you a purpose. He's going to give you a purpose because God is not intending for you to just kind of coast by, live by, do whatever. No, he's going to set a purpose in your heart. But that purpose, for you to complete it, you have to do it in faith. You cannot approach your purpose in God just kind of willy-nilly. There's got to be faith behind what you're doing. Peter kind of heard him out and said, you know what? This guy just showed me in my physical labor something he can do in a greater measure in my spiritual world. And, and, and God is so practical that way. God is so practical for us to see. Verse 11 says, so they pulled their boats up to shore. Look at this. On shore. And says, left everything and follow him. Would you read that line with me, that last line? One, two, three. Left everything and followed him. Wow. I mean, Peter was just like, what just happened to me is so unbelievable. I'll do whatever you ask me to. And it says, they left everything and follow him. They left everything and went with Jesus and started walking. Why? Why? Because Jesus is going to reward them by faith. The story doesn't end there. Because following Jesus, following Jesus, this is very important, it's a daily commitment. Following Jesus, it's a daily commitment. Have you ever been to church or have you ever had a spiritual experience? You're like, man, I, I know it's happened to me. Maybe you're more spiritual than I am. But great Sunday, you know, worship was amazing. Salvation, I mean, just great. And then you wake up Monday and feel like the devil owns you. No, I'm the only one. All right, well, you're more spiritual than me maybe. You know what happens. You have this great <laughs> spiritual experience. You feel awesome. And then the next day you're like, what in the world's going on? Everything just sort of goes the wrong way, the wrong way. And that is why following Jesus is a daily commitment. The doses you get tonight, not going to be, not going to cut it tomorrow. And what you get tonight, not going to, well, let me see if I can squeeze this one out to Sunday. Or maybe, oh, I got to go to Sabbath because I'm not going to make it a Sunday, you know. It, it just, it, it's a daily commitment. It's a commitment. It's my eyes are open in the morning. God, I'm recommitting to this process. God, I, I'm, once again, I'm engaging my heart with you. I want to follow you today. Things are going to come my way. I may not be, I may not crazy about, but I'm going to commit today, this day. It's a daily commitment. Yes. Give a hand to Christ if you're going to clap. It's for him. Where we're about to read in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is at the prime of his ministry in this description. Jesus is at the top. I mean, we're talking, uh, the guy is just in every TV channel possible, in every stadium is full. I mean, you name it, you convert it to today's 
terminology and it wouldn't even compare. Jesus is doing things that is absolutely unbelievable. If you read from chapter 8, he healed a woman that had been sick from issue of blood for 12 years. And in chapter 9, he resurrected Jairus' daughter. He continues on and feeds 5,000 men. So people equal to that to probably between 15 and 20,000 people. They say, some theologians say that is the largest crowd he probably ever had in front of him. I mean, he is at the prime of ministry, at the prime of ministry, doing amazing things. The disciples are right there in the middle of all this stuff, just seeing it with their own eyes. Jesus is activating them in ministry. They're doing amazing things. And then they have a conversation. Jesus does the miracle of the feeding, then brings him to the side. And other gospels have different ways to present it. And so you know, so I know you know this, but I'll just remind you. Matthew and John were eyewitnesses of Jesus. They were there. They were part of the crowd. Mark was a friend of Peter's and wrote kind of from that perspective. And then Luke was a man who did an investigation. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 1 starts by saying, I thoroughly investigated all this, writing to a friend named Theophilus. So, so he's saying, listen, I, this is what I've researched. So I love reading both the book of Acts written by Luke and also uh, the, the book of Luke. Because he is just so detailed in his approach. And so he's bringing us all this detail of this conversation saying, I talked to this guy. And so Jesus brings him aside and says, who do the people say that I am? You remember that? And so everybody, oh, yeah, yeah. And so everybody's answering. And it's awesome. And you know the answer. Peter, you know, says, hey, you know, you're awesome. And this is what you are, you know, and you're, you're the Christ. And so you know the story. Goes great. Jesus finally says, hey, listen. I'm going to tell you something that's really important for you to commit to what we're going to do. And then we see it in verse 22. Then it says like this, says saying, in verse 21 says, um, and he has strictly warned them and say, don't tell anybody. Don't, don't tell anybody what you know that I am the Christ because he knew they were going to kill him for that information. Don't do that. Verse 22 says, and saying, the son of man Suffer many, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised in the third day. And so right now, everybody's kind of like, you know what? Man, that sounds tough, but that's Jesus saying that's going to happen to him. He didn't say you guys, you know. So everybody's kind of like, all right, we understand. But then verse 23 says, then he said to them all. Oh, anytime the word of God says he said to them, he's saying it to who? To us. He's bringing it to us. Jesus says, I'm telling you what I'm about to suffer, but I want to tell you something. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, I'm going to ask you a personal question tonight. Are you here because you desire more of Christ? Then here's what he's saying to you. If you decide to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily and follow me. Some scriptures don't bring up the word daily, but I like how it says it here daily. He said, take up your cross, and just so you know, your mother-in-law is not your cross. <laughs> it is not that. It's a completely different thing, okay? He's saying denying daily. There is a self, there is something that you must do in your own heart, in your own self, that you have to say, you know what, I have to put aside my own desire because it is a daily commitment in Christ. It is a daily commitment that you have to put, you have to put aside. And this goes for everyone. Pastor Jim has always taught us, listen, we are not more anointing than you to live out the word of God. We have an anointing to teach it because God called us to do so. But in order to live it, we have to put the same amount of effort every day. Every day I have to recommit to Christ. Every day I have to figure out how to love my wife, how to take care of my children and love them too. Every day I have to get excited about what I do. Every day I have to refocus my relationship with God on a daily commitment. Why? Because I have to take up my cross, deny myself, deny my wants, deny certain things that I may want that I think are beneficial. And God is saying, not today, daily. And follow who? Follow me. Follow Christ. And Paul says it very well. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. He was telling them. He said, you can, you can have examples of people in your life, but as long as they are following Christ, that is the only way that works. Because following Christ, it's a daily commitment. I'm going to invite you tonight to make a daily commitment in your walk with Christ. That tomorrow when you open your eyes and say, today, Lord, is a fresh day. It's a fresh commitment. I don't know what's coming my way today, but I will put them in your hands right now. I will recommit to live in, to live in life as a Christian. I will recommit commit to being connected to you. When you do that, something changes. When you do that, Christ becomes active in your life. Because now you're saying, I'm not following my way, my desire, my want. I'm following what you want this day, Father. And it's so powerful. I mean, even, even in the 
prayer. And if you grew up Catholic, as many of us uh, Hispanics do, um, you know, we were taught the prayer, Jesus' prayer. You know, the prayer, we're always done a prayer. We say, Father, give us our daily bread. Help us today. Lead our nonsense. I mean, Jesus was saying, listen, that prayer is teaching you about doing something daily, committing daily, believing daily for provision, believing daily for forgiveness, believing daily for the kingdom of God to become active in your life, believing daily for something to happen. Don't hang on on yesterday's miracle to carry you for the rest of your walk with God because it won't happen. It won't happen. And I'm going to prove it to you today. You have to hang on to a fresh word. Following Jesus, following Jesus is very important. Following Jesus we have looked at it. Number one, it's rewarded by faith. Number two, it's a daily commitment. Number three, are you still with me tonight? Yes. It's a financial decision. How is that possible, Pastor? Abraham grabbed what he had and followed Jesus. Moses left what he had and followed God. Elisha left what he had on the field and followed Elijah. The disciples left everything they had and followed him. Here's the challenge for you and I. Here's the challenge. Possession should never be a factor to not follow Christ. Possession should never be a factor to not follow Christ. Why? Because why should I let possession stop me from following the one who has it all? It shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't be that way. You should not let what you have separate you from someone who has absolutely everything. That's almost foolish. But we allow that. We allow our possessions. We allow what we have to dictate the way we follow Christ. And following Christ is actually a financial decision that you have to make. You have to let in your heart know that money, that what you own, that what you believe is yours is actually God. And you're going to follow him even in that and that is a very profound decision. Everywhere in the word of God that you see a man or a woman following God, they gave up everything they had to follow him. Now, that doesn't mean they lived like homeless. God left them what they had, but the stuff they had did not have them. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so for us, the challenge when we say I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm saying I'm following Jesus and I'm making it as a financial decision, an investment in our finances. My wife and I early when we were dating, we made a choice that we would try not to carry heavy debts in our life, not to do that or to ever entangle ourselves in big businesses and things that would tie us down because we always wanted to be free to pack up and go at any moment. And this is before we got married. We had made a commitment to each other. We're going to be ready to pack up and go where God, where God calls us. And we've always lived that way. When there's a calling of God in our life, we've packed up what we had and we moved on. We moved on. We came from Las Vegas. I closed down my business in Dominican Republic and moved to South America to be a missionary. I, uh, I've done other things in my life. She's done those things in her life. It's a personal commitment. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm not holier than you that, for doing it. But I made a commitment in my head. What I have is not going to tie me down for what he wants for me. Why? Because he has it all. So if he has it all and tells me to go, he's got something else lined up somewhere else. Are you with me? And we have to believe that. We have to believe that. I'll repeat it. Possession should never be a factor to not follow Christ. What I have should never separate me from the one who has it all. Keep that in your heart. Christ has a conversation in Luke chapter 18. And this is where it's getting good because, you know, the disciples are kind of, um, you know, ministry is not necessarily going down, but the time of Jesus is ending if I kind of time it in the book of Luke at this point is probably three years, maybe two and a half years into Jesus' ministry. And so um, they're having this conversation and he's doing great ministry. It's the story of the rich young ruler. You already know the story, but I'll refresh it, uh, your memory. In Luke chapter 18, he presents it this way. Uh, Jesus is teaching to the Pharisees and different people, so everybody's hearing him. A young man, says a young man, a ruler of the age, gets up and says, a, a teacher, rabbi, a great master. He says, good master. I mean, you're, you're amazing. And Jesus says, um, you know, only God is good, but what's your question? What must I do to inherit eternal life, to inherit the kingdom of God? I mean, wh what should I do? He's so excited. He's hearing from Jesus. He's fire up. I mean, Jesus is preaching an amazing message, and he just can't hold it. What, what do I do? What do I do to, to go? You know, what, what, tell me. And Jesus says, man, you must do, you know, the commandments and obey your parents and do not you know, commit adultery and all this. And the guy says, oh, oh, man, I'm in. I mean, I've done that since I was a kid. I'm awesome, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, you know, okay, one more thing. He says, one more thing. And he tells him the one thing he wants us to give. 
And so Jesus started challenging this guy and saying, listen, I want you to do this. Verse 22, if you see it there, verse 21 says, all these things I kept from my youth. Look, verse 22 says, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, look at this, he said, you still lack one thing. He said, okay, okay, so I have, I'm 90% there. I'm good to go. Basically, my foot is in the door. He's going to give me the one thing I need, which I feel I have. And here it is. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And look, 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 look. And come and what? Ah. Sell everything you have, give it all to the poor, you will make treasures in eternity, and I want you to do something. I want you to follow me. Guess what? Jesus wasn't even interested in his money. And that's the fallacy that a lot of times we believe today, that Jesus wants her money. Jesus didn't say, sell everything you have and bring it to our ministry. You don't read that there. You don't. Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus didn't want his money. She's one of his heart and his commitment. But he's going to test our commitment and our level of loyalty by what we're willing to hand over. By what we're willing to hand over. Because following Christ is a financial decision. Because finances are so crucial to a life. You get up every morning and you work as hard as you can to provide for your family, for your children, for yourself. You do everything you can to provide retirement so in your elderly age, if possible, you can have something to fall back on. Or if you've invested in Social Security, well, I'll get that little bit and continue. I mean, we are fighting at every angle to maintain our finances in order if we can. Finances are so crucial to our life. And Jesus is saying, because this is so important to you, I don't want it to become more important to me in your life. I don't want him to become that. And so Jesus challenges him and says, listen, you can't do that. I want you to give it all up and follow me. Now, if you go to verse 28 before we read it, let's read verse 28. Because Jesus is saying, hey, you have to give all this up. And people are saying, how can somebody be saved then? This is so complicated, so difficult. Jesus says, no, it's not difficult. There's nothing impossible with Christ. And then, look, uh, if you go to verse uh, 28, please. Verse 28, right there on uh, Luke 18 says, Then Peter said, man, that guy is always in the middle of everything. This dude is unbelievable. It, I mean, you read it. I've never noticed it till studying for this message how much and how active this guy is. I mean, he is the, I mean, the voice of the disciple. Somebody needed to be said, tell Peter. He'll find a way to say it, you know. Um, then Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. That is so true. You know what Peter's doing? And maybe you're there. You've been walking with Christ and uh, things haven't lined up the way you wanted them to line up and you thought it was going to work a certain way. And so you are renegotiating your contract. That's what Peter's doing. Peter said, hey, man, a couple chapters ago, you impressed me with a bunch of fish and, I mean, you blew my mind. So I left everything, left the business and, and went with you. But I mean, this guy had money, had everything, and you told him he needed to give you everything to get it. I left everything. What about me? What about me? And uh, I tell you what, I know you felt that way. Halfway through your Christian walk, you've said, God, what about me? What is going on? It is, it is a personal, it is a, it is a financial decision that kind of leads you to ask you. Jesus. He, Peter said, hey, we've left it all to follow you. Give me some good news in this thing. Because they've been at it for a while with Jesus, you know. And Peter took a while to crack. Eventually he did. And he was an amazing man of God. But Peter is a real person. And you can read all about it in Pastor Luke's message. But he's saying, listen, we left everything. Look at verse 29 because this is a promise for you today. And Jesus said, he said to them, assuredly. Can you say that with me? One, two, three. Assuredly. Now. Jesus is saying, you can believe me, you can take this word to the bank, I'm telling you that if I tell you, I'm going to do it. That's what assuredly means. Surely means I'm backing it. Assuredly means I know who goes before me, and I, go, and I know who comes behind. Assuredly, I know who's backing my play. Jesus is saying, surely I'm going to tell you something. I say to you, there is how many people? There is no one. There is no one, not San Bernardino, not Colton, not Africa, not Latin America, not Europe. There is no one. There is no one who has left house or parents or brother or wife or children. Look, he continues on to say wife or children. For the sake of the kingdom of God, verse 30, verse 30, verse 30, who shall 
not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. And that is God's promise for you. Look, you know what he's saying to you? No, it doesn't matter what you give today. It's not, you cannot compare with what I can give to you. You can't compare it. Can't compare it. And you're going to have to make a commitment that following Jesus, it's a financial decision. Following Jesus means that what I have in the bank, what I can produce, where I live, belongs to you, Christ. That's, that's what it belongs to and when you make that decision, the clothes that I wear, the things that I believe are mine are actually yours. And I'm going to live out my life that way. And it's so powerful. It changes your way of thinking. Again, Jesus is not asking you to live. This is not a, a poverty commitment. That's not what he's asking you to do. He's asking you to do, if you have little or a lot, it all belongs to me. If you live that way, you'll have plenty every time. You'll have plenty every time. And, and it's a financial decision you make in your own heart. You have to say, God, you're going to lead me. Because why? No one. He didn't say, well, some people. You know, what happens in the kingdom is we have this formula. And then some people get it and some people don't. You know, no, no. He said, no one. No one that did that, Peter. I want you to know that. No one that does that will ever go without. I will give you many more times of what you gave up. And you will have on top of that, the cherry on top will be eternal life. So live with that. And it's the same for us today. He's saying... There's nothing you can give to him, he cannot give you in a greater measure. I'll end with this. Following Jesus, following Jesus, it's personal. Following Jesus, it's personal. Listen, I want you to go to John 21. And I'll read it out of the NIV. John 21. And this is what just blew my mind when I was reading this. Because what we're about to read is exactly what happened in Luke chapter 5 is set in different circumstances. And this is why Christ makes it so personal for us that following Jesus, it has to do with you. And tonight, you'll have a personal challenge. What is my part in following Jesus in the way he wants me to follow him? John 21, here's what's happening. Jesus has already resurrected. He's already shown himself several times to different disciples in different areas. Very fascinating part of the scripture. So <laughs> Jesus is coming uh, to this place. The disciples, it begins in chapter 21 saying, once again, Peter, we're not reading it, but once again, Peter says, hey, forget this, guys. I mean, this guy said he was coming to life and this Christianity thing, and this is not, this is not panning out the way we thought. So I'm going to go back to what I know to do, so I'm going fishing. All the guys are like, well, Peter, I mean, he, he, he the man, so if he's doing that, we're all going. So all the guys just kind of follow Peter. Everybody joins the crowd, jump on the boat. They head out to sea. Man, this is sounding so familiar. And it says that they fish all night, all night, all night. Now, at this point, Peter's a disciple. At this point, Peter's a man who's seen Jesus create amazing miracles. At this point, Peter's the man who was right there when Jesus fed the 5,000. At this time, Peter's the man who was there in the transfiguration. At this time, Peter's the man who defended Jesus from the soldiers. At this time, Peter is the man who's being closer to Jesus than any other person. And he's the first one to say, this thing is not panning out. I'm out. I'm going back to what I know. And the word of God says that Jesus came to shore, to shore while they were there once again kind of picking up the leftovers. Verse 6, he said, they don't know. They don't recognize his Jesus. Verse 5 says, they don't know his Jesus. So he tells them, hey, boys, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And it says this, when they did. I love this because you know what happened? They kind of already knew, like, man, this is starting to sound a little familiar. We did nothing. Then one guy shows up and tells me to throw it on the other side. So, yeah. I'll do it. Who knows? They don't know his Jesus. If you read verse 5, they don't know his Jesus. It says, and when they did, they were unable to haul the net because it was so full of the large number of fish. Verse 7, then the disciple who Jesus loved as John said to Peter, Peter is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he took up his garment and took off for the beach. And Peter realized this is amazing. This is deja vu. This is the same thing that in Luke chapter 5, this is how he called me. I know this is my master. I know this is he doing the same thing in my life. And you know what? Jesus is that way sometimes. He needs to remind us of the commitment we made on the first day we walked to him right in the middle of the road. Because following Jesus is a personal thing. It's not someone else's. It's you. And if you have to remind yourself of that excitement when you came down here and gave your heart to the Lord, then you got to do that. 
You got to do that so you don't say, this thing didn't work, I'm out. Jesus is saying, Peter said, you know what? This is the Lord. When John said it, he said, that's it. And he ran to Jesus. Obviously, Peter was a little embarrassed. Jesus said, don't worry about it, boys. Bring the fishes, says the word of God. They brought 153 um, fish, and so they brought it in. Jesus, grab a few of those fishes. I'm going to make you breakfast. So Jesus is going at it. That's amazing. That's got to be a heavenly breakfast, quote, unquote. Um, so that was a bad joke, but you can laugh. <laughs> so Jesus goes on in this conversation and in the conversation, Jesus said, hey, Peter, you already know the conversation. Do you love me more than these? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Then, fought, then, you know, then serve me, then stay. And so Jesus is going, you know what Jesus is doing? He's saying, listen, Peter, man, I, I know you were going to screw it up. So listen, just relax. I, I even prophesied it that you were going to do that. Just, just, just hear me out. Hear me out. God is so good. Listen, if you feel you've gone too far from God, he's so good in telling you, hear me out. You can come back. Hear me out. You can come back, but you're going to have to renegotiate the terms of following him. You're going to have to say, you know what? I got I to gotta redo this commitment because it's personal. It's personal. God, Jesus wasn't asking everyone anymore. He didn't say to everyone, come. No, no, he's talking to Peter saying, hey, listen, do you love me? I want you to do this. I want you to do my commandment. And this is the conversation. Jesus restores Peter to relationship with him. And verse 18 says, very truly, talking about uh, Peter, says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are older, you will be stretched out. You, you will stretch out your hands, says, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Now, this is coming in the culmination. Now, check this out. Verse 19, Jesus said this, indicating the kind of death which Peter would glorify God, with which Peter would So he's saying, listen, I'm prophesying how you're going to die. And look at the words. Then he said to him, what did he say to him? Same words. Then he said to him, follow Jesus didn't tell him, Peter, you're going to be amazing. You're going to be famous. I mean, this Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. You're going to be the leader of the most awesome uh, Christian movement that ever been. You're going to be the main guy. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to tell you, man, when you were little, someone dressed you. When you're old, someone's going to walk you to your death. Who wants that prophecy tonight? No one lining up? That's what Jesus, and then Jesus says, hey, but I still want you to. It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. And so for us tonight, that's what Jesus is asking. It doesn't end there because Peter was a hard guy to crack. You know, so it says the word of God that Peter looked behind him and saw John. Now, John describes himself as the apostle who Jesus loved. So, so Peter turns around and says, hey, man, you told me how I'm going to die. How about this guy? You're like, like encourage me by telling me how bad this dude's going to do. You know, I mean, that would be awesome. And for many of us in our Christian world, because it's personal, we tend to do that. We tend to feel better when we see someone else having a harder time. Deep inside we say, I'm with you, I'm praying. But internally you said, man, I wanted to be successful now. I know when someone else success is really hard to clap for someone else. It's really hard to rejoice for someone else. And Peter was there and I've been there. And you've been there. Peter was like, okay, I know I'm going to die, but this guy has had it good all our lives. I mean, in ministry, he was your buddy. He was with us. He's always, I mean, you left him with your mom, me. I've been chased around. I was the one fighting. I was, you call me the devil. I mean, say something good. Before you go, say something good, would you? You know, so, so he's just negotiating the terms again. And this is, Jesus is so beautiful and profound. And I'll end with this. Jesus answered. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? What is that to you? Like, nobody's talking to you. No, I'm not asking John anything. But you must follow me. But you must follow me. And tonight, that is the question that God wants to ask you. Would you follow him? Would you make it, even if it's a personal decision, would you make it today? If it's a financial decision, would you decide today? If you have faith, God will reward you for that. You have to do that. You have to say, God, I am committed to this because following Jesus is a daily commitment in our walk with Christ. Listen to this. Listen to this. Today, it is very important. You remember that trip I took? It's the same way in the spiritual walk. One day you'll stand in heaven and your name, if your name is in that paper, somebody's going to tell you, go ahead and follow me. You have access to the kingdom of heaven today. But you have to follow him now in this earth.
That is a powerful reality that you and I have to believe. Today, I want to encourage you, just follow him. Just say, Jesus, I want to follow you from this day forward. God spoke to you tonight. Give him a hand. He deserves it. I'm going to do things a little differently. I believe God wants to challenge you in your salvation, in your position with Christ. So if you would give me five minutes, five minutes of your time, that's all I take. Five minutes of your time is all I ask that you don't leave this place. I usually end early and we'll do so tonight. You will get home in time. You will get your children. But I'm asking you for five minutes of your time. Five minutes of your time to consider where you're at in life right now. Five minutes of your time to understand this. Here's what we talked about today. If you've never, ever made this commitment to Christ, if you've never said, Jesus, I want to follow you from this day forward, I want to challenge you to make that decision tonight. How do you know if you're following Christ or not? Listen to this. Is today where your last day on this planet? Would you open your eyes in heaven or in hell? Most people would say, Pastor, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And I read the statistics, especially dealing with Latinos, with Hispanics. I, I know that we are raised to, to trust God and to have reverence for God. And listen to this. Statistics say 92% of Hispanic descendants say they'll go to heaven because grandma told us because we they took us to church because we we had to do that prayer at night before we went to bed we did religious things but nowhere in the word of God says if I did religious things if I believe if grandma told me if mom said that I would make it to nowhere there's not one place in heaven that says that is the way on the bible on the word of God says that is the way to get to heaven it's not there simply not there Pastor, I'm a good person. I don't harm people. I, you know, I, I'm very decent. I understand this environment thing. I believe the earth is, you know, the Lord's. And so I'm protecting it the best I can. I do those good things. There's nowhere here written that good things get you there. As a matter of fact, it says that if you think that being good gets you in heaven, your good deeds are like trash to God. Why? Why? Why would God allow you to go into heaven because you're good? Then why would he send his only begotten son to die on a cross, a bloody mess, for you so that you can behave and make it into heaven? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You say, Pastor, you know what? I, I'm a little better than that. I do. I'm a knucklehead from time to time, but I do go to church from time to time. When I was a kid, I was taught a verse. I still remember that verse and can quote it today. That's wonderful. I'm glad you did that. I was also taught the word of God when I was a kid, but that did not make me a Christian. You know why? The word of God says that demons believe and tremble. They're not going to heaven. The word of God says and shows us that Satan quoted verses of the Bible, the Old Testament, to Jesus when he tempted him, and he's not going to heaven. See, God is not interested in how much you know right here, right here, look, 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 right here, right here. You're the most brilliant Bible scholar there is. No, 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 no. He's interested in, in this. In your heart. Are you following me from right here? Are you following me from right here? And that's the invitation I ask for you today. In this church, this is how we do it here. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I will, I will raise my hand. I want you to raise your hand. I will pop my hand and you go, you know what? That's me. I want to do that. Pastor, why do I have to raise my hand? Why do I have to do that publicly? Here's why. Here's why. Jesus makes two statements absolutely powerful. He says this. When I come... I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Jesus doesn't want to expel anybody. But Jesus is saying, I don't want people who are half in. Remember, following Jesus, it's a personal thing. Jesus is saying, you have to decide in your heart, where am I at tonight? I have to take that step towards Christ. Here's a second statement he makes. He says, if you acknowledge me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand. We acknowledge you today. I'll acknowledge you before my father. Wow, that's one of us, God. But if you deny me, in the same phrase, if you deny me, I will deny you. He says it right there. He's saying, if you're embarrassed of me, I want nothing to do with you. But I already went to the cross, died for you. I absolutely love you. I want you to follow me. But it's a personal decision. And here's your decision. I count to three. You raise your hand. We'll pray together right here, inviting Jesus in your heart. I haven't hidden anything from you. I'm not playing tricks with you. I've been completely honest with you. Now you have to be honest with yourself. Where are you at with Christ tonight? 
If you're not walking with Christ, tonight you better raise your hand and say, God, I want to start today. If you did this prayer at one point in your life, but you did not live out the things you said with your mouth, restart your commitment with Christ today. He's inviting you today. If you're sitting there tonight and know you're not in the right position with Christ and need to follow him today, renegotiate the terms of that agreement. You can do it today. When we count to three, you raise your hand. We'll pray together. Are you ready? One, two, and three. Is there anyone here? Thank you. One, two. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands up. Put your hands down. Thank you. Three, four, five. Thank you. Put your hands down. Six. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Seven. Awesome. Thank you. I see seven wonderful people. Did not embarrass them. Won't embarrass you. But you have to decide. This is for me. This is for me. Yeah. Thank you. I see that hand. If that child wants to pray, absolutely. Eight. Thank you so much. You can put your hand down. Is there anyone else? Jesus said, let the children come to me. She wants to do it, let her do it. Bring her. Is there anyone else? I believe you're out there. I feel you out there. But you have to decide. Remember, it's a personal thing. God is not going to raise your hand to him. God is not going to do any of that. You have to decide, I'm the one who's got to do this. This is my time. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Just let me know. Pastor, that's me. I want to start this today. I want to follow him. Other than those seven hands that I saw, eight hands or so. Is there anyone else? Awesome. Can we give a hand to Christ then? Powerful. Listen, in a moment, in a moment, we'll let you out just in a moment. Don't leave as they come forward. That discourages them like, hey, he's leaving. I might as well leave too. No, let them come forth. In a moment, we're all going to stand. And when we all stand, if you raise your hand, grab your coat, sweater, purse, Bible, water. Don't leave anything in your chair and you come forward and I want to pray with you. Here's the other thing. If you didn't raise your hand, if you said, I wasn't sure, you haven't missed your time yet, you can still come. When they come, you come. Join them down here and say, you know what? I'm going to follow him starting tonight. Would we stand and welcome them into the kingdom? If you raise your hand, come on forth. We want to pray together tonight, inviting Jesus in your heart. Thank you. This is your moment. This is your moment. Come forth. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need to, this is your moment. Say, you know what? I'm not going to wait. Thank you. I'm not going to wait. I'm giving my heart to Christ tonight. Awesome. Come on, make your way. You still have time. Thank you. you. There's still plenty of time. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. God is so good. Make your way. Still have time. All right, listen, if you're up here, we're going to pray together in a moment. And what you're doing is you're saying, God, I'm inviting you into my heart. I, I love praying with you guys. Normally, Pastor Joe will pray, but I just love this part so much, I want to steal it from him, okay? And I want to pray with you guys. And everybody here wants to pray. Here's what you're saying. You're saying yes to Christ with your mouth. But the Bible says that if you believe it in your heart, that moment, something new starts. So it's not some magical words. It's just the honesty of your hearts as you say this word, saying, Jesus, I'm inviting you tonight. I'm starting something new. Is that okay? Would you repeat with us? Can we repeat with them? Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins, all the wrongdoings I've committed against you. Today, I give them back to you and forgive me for committing them. I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, be my Lord, be my leader until eternity. Fill me with your Holy Spirit this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Awesome. Look, let's do this. If you would give us just a few minutes more of your time. Pastor Joel, he's one of our pastors, one of our leaders here. He's going to put something in your hand. Look what he's going to do. If you need more prayer, they'll pray with you some more. But also, he'll offer you a couple of things. He'll offer you an SPT. An SPT is a spiritual personal trainer, somebody that would help you to walk with Christ. See, today you made a commitment. You say, God, I want to follow you. They will help you to continue that journey so you can make it to the end. And he'll let you know what we have in our church. But listen, listen, if you commit yourself, remember we talk about it as a daily commitment, if you commit yourself for one year to be here in church, to be connected in church, you're going to grow in a way that you would say, I never knew life was this way. Life is transformed.
for me. But commit yourself in a daily commitment starting today, all right? So follow Pastor Joel. He'll put that information in your hand, and then they'll see you at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Come on, give him a hand, Christ. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.